if you'll turn with me to uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus the Messiah, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted, according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Messiah Jesus our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity we have now to begin to look into your, your book, the letter that Paul wrote uh, to Titus, Lord, to receive from you the instruction that you desire to give us that we might grow in your grace, that we gr might grow in our knowledge of uh, our glorious salvation in our Messiah and in your will for our lives, Lord, and how you want us to live and how you want to, in, how you want to use us uh, in the world around us. And so, Lord, I ask that your spirit would be at work as we meet together, that he would stir up a desire for this study in the heart of each one who hears. I ask that your spirit would work in uh, me as well, that uh, I might be a fruitful, useful tool in your hand this morning. So we look forward to your presence and what you're going to accomplish uh, through our time together. And we commit ourselves to you in Yeshua's holy name. Amen. Amen. So uh, many of you have been asking me over the last several weeks as we drew close to the end of Book of Revelation, uh, what are you going to preach on next? And I thought, well, I could pick something like Ezekiel or Jeremiah and just spend the next five or six years uh, going through another book. Uh, but I decided to uh, go through, after praying uh, about it and asking others to pray along with me, I decided to stay in the New Covenant Scriptures. Normally I like to uh, alternate, you know, Old Covenant, New Covenant, to keep us focused on the fact that it's all one book with one message. Uh, but I decided that in light of uh, the, the, uh, uh, where our congregation is at right now and where our world is at right now, that the book of Titus has a lot to say to us, a lot of very practical insight uh, for us. And so if you stop and you think about it, um, we, we are living in a world, you know, we've been going through, we've been watching uh, what's been going on in Israel uh, between uh, Hamas and Israel and the rockets, uh, the thousands of rockets that have been fired and Israel's response and trying to uh, weaken Hamas so that they can protect uh, the is Israeli citizens, both Jewish and Arab, uh, from the rocket attacks uh, and uh, to hopefully to weaken Hamas. And uh, that's, been, that's how I've been praying, that, that Hamas would be so weakened that more moderate voices could rise up uh, for the good of the Palestinian people as much as for Israel's good. Uh, but, we, you know, so we've been watching that. But, and then, you know, we, we've also been reading about rioting that's been going on in, uh, in some of the cities in Israel where there's a, a, a mixed population where Jews and Arabs have been living together fairly comfortably for a very long time now. All of a sudden, there are riots going on. And then, then I was very dismayed to read uh, an online uh, piece uh, just, uh, uh, just yesterday, I think, about it, it listed all of the anti-Semitic attacks that have been happening over just the last few days uh, in relationship to what's going on in Israel and that people feel more and more free to express outright anti-Semitic, not only words and thoughts, but violence as well. And so we see that building. And I think in our, uh, personally, and I, th I, I believe many of you would agree with me on this, that it's not gonna get better. It will more than likely get worse. Certainly the scriptures tell us that things will get worse, especially for God's elect. Uh, we saw that especially during our study of the tribulation period in Revelation. 
uh, and we are heading in that direction even now. But even in our own country, we see um, anger and bitterness growing and factions dividing people. You know, we, we see, uh, you know, granted, uh, yes, there are things that we need to adjust, issue, uh, um, not adjust, uh, we need to address in our country related to um, uh, injustices and things like that. Those are real, and as believers in Messiah, we should, we should care about those things. But the world is providing solutions that only make the problems worse. They only inspire greater vitriol and hatred and divisions between people. And so the world around us is getting darker and darker, and it's not only in relationship to economic issues and race issues and things like that, it's in relationship to whether or not you are wearing a mask or whether or not I'm wearing a mask and how we judge one another on the basis of that. And that, that unfortunately here in our own community, we have been influenced much more by the world in our response to one another's convictions in this area than we have been influenced by the scriptures. You know, we, we look at people and we judge them for wearing a mask because we think they're living out of fear. And we judge people for not wearing a mask because we are, we are judging their hearts thinking they don't care about anybody else but themselves. They're being selfish. And, and those come, come out in glances and in words and things like that. And so the world is becoming a darker and darker place. We, the body of Messiah, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be making a difference. God saved us to be different, and he saved us to demonstrate to a darkening world the light of his love. And so the book of Titus is really all about how a local community of believers made up of Jews and Gentiles are to live out the truth of what God has done for us in Messiah Jesus in a way that not only has a positive impact on our community and strengthens us and builds us, but has a positive impact around us in the relationships that we find ourselves enmeshed in as believers in Messiah Jesus outside of the body. And so all of these things are the things that Paul addresses in his letter to Timothy this morning. And so this morning, uh, I'm, 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 I was, I'm not going to preach like a normal message out of the text this morning, okay? I just want to introduce the book to you in a way that I hope will encourage you to leave here and read the book. <laughs> it's really short. You know, it's, it depends on, on, on the typeface in your Bible, but in my ba Bible, it's literally two and a third pages. You know, and if you can't knock that out <laughs> at least once during this week, uh, let's talk. But that's my desire. My goal today is just to introduce you to the book and to try to begin to uh, encourage and develop a hunger in you so that, you, that in our study of the book of Titus, we will uh, really be asking God to open our eyes and to work in our hearts. And so with that, let me give you some background information on this very short letter, the letter of Paul to Titus. Of course, the letter is written, as we see in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Yeshua Messiah. And so, Paul who? Paul is Saul of Tarsus, who was a, a well-trained, highly respected uh, Pharisee of his day, of the early uh, period of the believing community after Yeshua's uh, ascension and the outgoing of the gospel. He was a vicious enemy of the believing community, uh, went out, made a point of going out to cities that had uh, Jewish believing communities in them to arrest leaders of those communities so he could bring them back to Jerusalem to stand trial before the Sanhedrin. Uh, yet God met Paul. Paul, I love this story. 
God, Paul was not looking for God. <laughs> you know, Paul thought he was serving God. He really did. He really thought he was serving God. But God knew that he wasn't. And God, in his grace and his mercy, reached in and got Paul's attention on the road to Damascus and brought Paul to a living faith in the living Messiah. And then used Paul and used all of his gifts and used all of his training in the scriptures and rabbinics, et cetera, et cetera, to become the premier, his premier emissary to the predominantly Gentile world, even though his pattern was always, in every instance, to bring the message to his Jewish brethren first and then to share it with the Gentile people around as well. And so that's the Apostle Paul, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about him next week in light of the way he introduces himself in this book, because it, it's an important thing. And so just think about that, that, that here's Paul, who was way up there in, in people's eyes in terms of his role in Jewish leadership, right? And how he introduces himself as you read the beginning of the text. And so the date of writing, it was written somewhere towards the end of Paul's life, probably somewhere in the range of uh, A.D. 63 to 65, all right? So Paul had been at his ministry for a couple of decades at this point. And uh, it, is, it was written probably during one of his, his imprisonment, his house arrest in Rome, around the same time he wrote 2 Timothy. And so again, the context of the letter to me lends itself to part of the context in which we find ourselves as a community because we have an older man who is approaching the end of his ministry addressing younger men who are going to be carrying on that ministry in his absence and so that's another one of the reasons I thought that this would be an appropriate text for us to look at uh, here at the congregation and so Paul wrote the letter to Titus, one of his protégés. I'll talk a little bit more about Titus in just a minute. Uh, but, but he, Paul himself, is driven to make sure his disciples stay on the course on which he has set them. His concern is for them and their well-being, their spiritual health, and his concern is for God's flock, the people that they serve to make sure that they are hearing the truth, that they are being encouraged to live out that truth the way God intended for them to live out that truth from the very get-go. And so the recipient of the letter. So the recipient of the letter is, who do you guess? Come on, Titus. Right, I, I just wanted to see if you were listening. So Titus is the recipient of the letter, and we read that in verse 4, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. And so Titus was a trusted Gentile co-worker. He was a Gentile co-worker. It comes out in uh, Galatians chapter 2, where it says not even Titus was compelled to be circumcised, meaning that in his participation with Paul in his evangelistic ministry, Titus was not required to be circumcised, uh, thereby indicating he is a Gentile. And he was a co-worker of Paul. I found this very interesting. I did not know this uh, until this week, uh, but how, do you know how many years Titus and Paul served together? We're estimating close to 20 years, two decades. They had been serving together in gospel ministry. I, I just was astounded by that. It was somewhere between, uh, you know, they started in about 46 uh, of the common era, and uh, let's say Paul died in 65, and so it would have ended there, about 40 years, 19, I'm sorry, 19 or 20 years. Uh, he accompanied Paul and ba Barnabas uh, on their mission of mercy to Jerusalem from Titus's home church in, of Antioch in Syria. That's where Titus is from. Uh, Paul's, he was Paul's special representative to the Corinthian church during Paul's third missionary journey. All right, so this is again is later in Paul's career. And he was, 
Paul's special representative to the believing community in Corinth. And when you read 1 and 2 Corinthians, you know that could not have been an easy job. These people were even more mashugi than we are. So they were a challenge. And so he was this special emissary. And then he carried Paul's severe letter from Ephesus to Corinth. We read about that in 2 Corinthians. We don't have that letter, but the severe letter. He carried that letter. It was a letter of rebuke, of instruction, of really uh, calling people to account in Corinth. And uh, he, on, on, in delivering that letter, on his way back from delivering that letter, he later ran into Paul in uh, Macedonia. And so then again, uh, he led a group of men. He, so you got to understand, it wasn't just him working by himself. We know at least in one instance, he led a group of men who were sent to Macedonia to collect an offering for the destitute believers in Jerusalem, for the Jewish believers in Jerusalem who were having trouble making ends meet. And again, we read about that in 2 Corinthians. Paul's, he was Paul's choice to strengthen the believing communities in Crete. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we know about Crete. Uh, so that's the primary, the primary recipient of the letter is the man Titus, who is a Gentile believer in Messiah Jesus, who has a 20-year co-laborship with the Apostle Paul in frontline evangelism and in supporting the now existing believing communities throughout the Mediterranean area. The secondary recipients of the letter, who do you think those would be? The believers spread all over Crete, the different churches that existed, the different pockets of believing communities that existed in the cities of Crete. In fact, at the end of the letter, uh, the, the final verse of the letter says, grace be with all y'all. And so it's clearly Paul has in his mind that this letter will not only be read by Titus, but by the church at large as well. And so um, <clears throat> there are lots of other things we could say about uh, Titus, but I'll, I'll save those perhaps uh, for next week's sermon. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about Crete itself. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Uh, it's the, oh, I forgot to bring the remote. Uh, I don't see the remote. Did you steal the remote? Okay, Josh, could you throw up the first slide for me? Thank you. <clears throat> there we go. So there's Crete, right there in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean. It was the third largest uh, Greek island. Uh, it was, it covers, I, let's see, I wrote this down, it covers 3,219 square miles. It has a, uh, uh, a 3,000 foot mountain uh, or something of that size in the middle of it. Uh, it, I think for our purposes, it's important to know that it had a Jewish community. It had several different Jewish communities at this time. In fact, Josephus, who wrote uh, a short time after uh, Titus was written, a Jewish historian, uh, Josephus, um, I'm sorry, not Josephus, uh, Philo, wrote that there were already uh, many Jewish communities during this period on the island of Crete. Can we get the next slide? And so uh, there's the island a little bit close up. I ask your forgiveness for cutting off some of the letters when I snipped it. And you might recognize the town of Fair Havens from your study of the Bible. We read about Fair Havens uh, during Paul's trip when he was going from Jerusalem to Rome for his trial before Caesar, uh, where he contested his trial. And he was on his way in a ship. Uh, they encountered some bad weather. It wasn't the right time of year. Uh, they uh, sought harbor on the south side of the island to protect themselves from the storm that was coming in from the north. And uh, against Paul's uh, prophetic admonition, uh, the, uh, the owner of the boat and the captain decided that they were going to sail anyway. And the boat sank. They lost their cargo, but the 271 or so people uh, on it uh, were saved. Uh, and so what you want to think about when you look at this, 
when you look at it and you read Paul saying this in verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in in order whatever remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. All right, so each city had its own believing community. And don't think about each city had a church on the corner of Main and Sixth. You know, these were probably home fellowships that were meeting, or perhaps they were meeting together. Uh, you know, larger groups would meet in uh, perhaps a wealthy person's home or something of that nature. But you have to think, he says, he, there are churches, there are believing communities all over the island that Titus is being sent Uh, to minister to. And it's important for us to recognize that those churches were started probably, this is not specifically stated in our text or even in the book of Acts, but the likelihood is is that the believing communities of Crete began when shortly after the Shavuot of which we read in Acts chapter 2, the Pentecost, the the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, the time in which the Holy Spirit came uh, to indwell God's people, the birthday of the church as we would talk about it. And that the text in Acts tells us clearly that there were Jews and proselytes from Crete who were there. And so our assumption is that many of those people came to faith in those first days and months of the spread of the good news when thousands, including priests, came to faith in Jewish priests, Levitical priests, not the Catholic kind, came to faith in Messiah Jesus at that time. And so these people went back with the good news of Messiah and they began to share it. Where? Where they have shared it? They would have first shared it in their synagogues and then perhaps it would have begun to spill over into the Gentile community, especially as proselytes in those synagogues would have heard the good news. And so he sends them to a, an island that's a rather sizable island that has a number of a large, of not a, we don't know how large it was, but a significant uh, Jewish population. And so that's the island of Crete. Josh, we can go to the blank slide that's next, I believe. Thank you. And so here's, here's the theme. I want to talk a little bit about the theme of the book. The theme is this. Healthy doctrine promotes right living. Healthy doctrine promotes right living. If you really know what you are supposed to know, that knowing leads to a relationship with Messiah that results, according to God's intention, in a changed life. Right? God delivered our ancestors from Egypt, yes? Out of bondage to, to, to slavery, in, from bondage to slavery in Egypt, and he redeemed them out, and he let them one run wild, every man doing that which was right in his own eyes. No, he saved them to change them. He saved them so that they would walk with him in relationship and that their lives would reflect that relationship, every aspect of their lives, not only within the Jewish community, but as it impacts outside the Jewish community as well. Well, the same paradigm exists for those of us who are believers in Messiah Jesus. And we tend to forget that because we are so zealous for salvation by grace through faith alone and that salvation that being born again receiving the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that brings us from spiritual death to spiritual life that brings us from being under the wrath of God to being freed from the wrath of God from being under God's judgment to being declared righteous and just in God's sight we are so zealous for the fact that that is an absolutely free gift that you can never earn and there's nothing you can possibly do to ever acquire it. We are so zealous for that message, which is incredibly important. I'm, I'm, I'm not dissing that or, or trying to denigrate that, but we lose sight of the fact that the intention of that message and that act of grace in our lives through faith is designed to make a 
change in us. That's SOP. That's SOP. And so that's what the book is dealing with. That's what's on Paul's heart. He sees and has heard about what's going on amongst the believing communities in Crete. And he's alarmed. (laughs) And he wants his good friend and co-worker, Titus, to deal with it. To deal with it. And so that's the idea. And so the, the idea of sound faith and doctrine comes up several times in this very short letter. It comes up at least uh, four times in the letter. And so when you read the word, as you're reading the the text this week, uh, when you read sound faith or sound doctrine, read healthy. Healthy. What does healthy mean? Healthy is that which brings and encourages and facilitates what? Life. It's the, contra- it's the, con- the, the, the contrast would be toxic doctrine and faith. What are toxins? Toxins are poisons. They're things that kill and diminish life. And so Paul is very much interested in equipping and encouraging and challenging Titus and the believing community to make sure they are nourished on healthy faith and doctrine healthy faith and doctrine. And then another theme that comes out, or another focus in, in, in the book that supports the theme that I just suggested to you, is the presence of the word uh, deeds. Deeds, or uh, some of our translations translate that works. Either translation is uh, fine, they both mean the same things. What's, what's a work and what's a deed? Is it something you think? only or is it something you actually do right it's an activity it's something that is done and the word works and deeds are used eight times in this very short epistle and you'll notice that as you read through the text what's interesting is good deeds or good works are is used six different times in the text six different times in the text and you know when we just don't like talking about good works do we Well, you should be doing good works. Well, that sounds like works to me. Well, it is works, but you're not working for your salvation. You're working because of your salvation. And that's the point that Paul wants Titus to reinforce. He talks about good deeds. In in chapter 1, verse 16, it sets the paradigm for the letter. Let me just read this verse for us. Uh, 116 says, For they profess to know God, and these are false teachers, toxic teachers, as it were, by their deeds, they deny him. You see, by what they do, how they're living their lives, the practical things that they do with their lives, being detestable and disobedience and worthless for what? Any good deed, any good work. And so that's the paradigm there. The paradigm is if you're walking in the truth, Good works are part of what God intends for your life. If you're not embracing the truth and you are believing toxic teaching, there will be an absence of the kinds of things in your life that God wants to manifest. And so Paul also goes on, having said that, I want to say this very clearly, Paul makes absolutely sure that we understand that good deeds is not a means of salvation, but is its expected fruit, the expected fruit of salvation. And he says that here, I'll just read very quickly from part of uh, chapter 3, verse 8. So that those who believed God, and that, and, and the way the verbs are there, it's having believed and still believing, in other words, those who have a living faith in the Lord, should be careful to be engaging in good deeds, to be engaging in good deeds. It's the same theme that we read about as we've encountered before in Ephesians uh, 2.10, where Paul says, for we are his, meaning Messiah's workmanship or God's workmanship, created in Messiah Jesus for what? Good works, good deeds, 
which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. This is Paul, another attempt of Paul to have one of his protégés actualize that truth in the community that he's serving. And so the, what's the theme of our study? And so let's, uh, Josh, could you put up that uh, last slide? Second to last slide, I'm sorry. Uh, next, previous one, thank you. So this is what we're going to call our study in Titus. Do good. <laughs> I, I wanted to keep it simple, right? Do good. And then the subtitle is being a force for good in an evil world being a force for good and evil world. And I would encourage you to go this week, look at two, chapter 2, verse 14, and see how that supports uh, this whole idea. And actually, let's look at it now. Josh, can we get the, this next slide? Thank you. So uh, Titus 2, verses 13 and 14 says this. Looking for the blessed hope and of the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Messiah Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself a people for his own possession, zealous on fire for good deeds. Like, yeah, let's do some good stuff. That's why he saved us. That's why he wants us uh, to understand, to have a full and complete knowledge of the truth of our faith. Because he wants us to be different. He wants to change us. He wants us to make us different than the world around us so that we will be salt and light and people will see the power of the gospel manifest in people like you and me. And so that's it. That's the introduction. I hope I have stimulated your study juices a little bit that you will commit yourself to reading through the, this very short letter of Titus, perhaps several times this week, uh, looking for those themes in it, trying to get a handle on, okay, well, he talks about this here and this here and this here, but they all hang together. They all hang together and see if you can uh, begin to develop an appreciation for that. And then, of course, to pray and ask God to help you see where your life needs to change where you need to walk more in conformity with the full knowledge of the faith and understanding of who God is, how he has saved you, why he has saved you, and what he brings to the table to enable you to be different and to do the good works for which he saved you. And for those of you who may not yet know Messiah Jesus, I would encourage you to read this book because it will challenge you to your very core. It will call you to live a life that you know nobody can live. Because it's a life that is only possible through the life of Messiah. And it would be our hope that as you read this book and you see the standards to which we are called, you'll recognize your inability to achieve that standard, but then you will see the gift that God has provided for you in Messiah Jesus to save you from your sin and to change you and to make you an agent of change in the world that so desperately needs it. Let's pray.